Now let's talk some about how we know where to put our electrons. And to do this, we need another rule. We talked about the Pauli exclusion principle in our last video. And in this one, we want to talk about the off-ball principle. Ah, forgot to bring my pointer back. There we go. So energy levels and sublevels fill from the lowest to the highest energy. The lowest energy sublevels are the easiest to get into, so that's where the electrons start. So what this means is that S has to fill before P, which has to fill before D, which has to fill before F when things are in the same energy level. So let's look at what this looks like for a box diagram for these. So for example, let's take lithium here. Lithium has a 1s and a 2s. In the 1s, there are two electrons, and there's only one box, so one's got to go up, one's got to go down. In my 2s, I only have one left, so we just put one up. So this could be my box diagram. You'll notice I put labels down here to help me identify them. Now for carbon here, it's going to have one box, which is 1s, another box, which is 2s. And then when we get to 2p, we need three boxes that represent 2p. So I'm going to make a label, and I'm going to try to make it clear it's all three boxes. So we go 1, 2, and they're paired together. And we go 1, 2, and they're paired together. And we went to 2s before 2p. And then I've got two more, so I do one up here and one up here. So now we might ask ourselves, why did I put two up? Why not put them paired together? To answer this question, we'll need another rule. And note, I am not concerned with the names of these rules. That's not my focus, although I provide them here to help you in your reading, or maybe if at some point you want to just understand it a bit more, it might help you memorize them better if you understand the rules, if you like attaching them to names. I am focused on, can you use these rules appropriately? So this next rule is Hund's rule. So when you're filling orbitals that are degenerate, remember that means they have the same energy level, you place one electron in each orbital rather than pairing up electrons in the same orbital. That's why I did what I did when I did carbon on the last slide. So let's go back and look at carbon again. So for carbon, we have 1s, 2s, and 2p. And we've got to fit six total electrons in here. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5, 6. If we had put a pair where it was up and down in this first box, that would be incorrect. And this isn't something that has some greater meaning that you have to worry about for this class. For our class's purposes, we're just going to say this is the way the atoms function, and this is what they're going to do. So we'll just learn it at that, and that's, what we'll, that's the level of explanation we're going to worry about. Let's look at one more example. Let's take an example with nitrogen. So nitrogen has seven electrons. And that's supposed to be a 7, not a 2. So 7. So 7 electrons means it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And again, we'll talk about how I need to put these exact numbers in a few slots. So we've got our 1s box, our 2s box, and our 2p boxes. So here we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven. If you were to go on to oxygen, which has eight electrons, you would have run out of empty boxes, so you would start pairing them together. So then you would put down arrow electrons, representing the spin minus one half, into the boxes to fill them up the rest of the way. So how is it I'm able to predict where I put each orbital, each electron? How do I know it's in the s orbital or the p orbital? or the d orbital, or the f orbital. There are three ways to deal with this. The first way I'm going to show you is using the periodic table and its picture. I can show you how to organize it. The second way is there's a chart you can memorize. Or third, you can literally memorize the entire list and just know them in order. So the way I do it looking at the chart would be to start with the fact that you're going to, you notice the numbers go from left to right. They go one, two. And then as you go down each row, you start again. So helium is at the end over here at 2. You then go back to period 2, which starts at 3 and goes all the way to 10 at neon. Then you go to 11. That's going to be the start of the next period, period 3 with sodium. Go all the way to 18 and argon. You go back to the front again. Potassium's 19. Krypton's 36. So you always read left to right 
And when you get to the end, one of the noble gases, the things that appear in group 8A or group 18, depending on how you label it, you go back to the left side and start again. Now, every time you add an electron to your system, you can understand it as being added to one of four groups, and they're color-coded here. So for example, the S-block elements are the ones that happen at the beginning. Note that helium is the one exception that shows up strangely because there is no 1p orbital. So the first two you just have to know, hydrogen gets a 1s1, helium gets 1s2. Now when you get to the second row, you've already got the 1s1 of hydrogen and the 1s2 of helium. For lithium, what we do is the third electron has to go into the 2s orbital. The reason for this is it is now in period two. So when we're adding electrons to the s orbital of period two, it's gonna go into 2s2, 2s instead of 1s. If you go down to sodium, you'll notice sodium has an electron in the 3s orbital. Potassium, which is K, that element 19, that's gonna be 4s1. Rubidium down here is gonna be 5s1. Cesium is gonna be 6s1. Francium is gonna be 7s1. You're always gonna start each row with the S block, which are the first two columns. And those, you take the period you're in and you put the electron there. So for example, lithium here is 2s1. Whereas beryllium, that's got four electrons, it's gonna go up to 2s2. Now once you head over to the pink zone, that's your P block. So starting with boron, they start going in the P orbital instead of the S. So there's boron, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So it kept the first four electrons, the one for hydrogen, the se second when you get to helium, and the third and fourth for lithium and beryllium. So that's the 1s2, 2s2. But now that you're in boron, it's 2s2, 2p1. And you keep going. Carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And you keep counting all the way you get till you get to neon, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now, the next part you may notice is that when you get to sodium, this is starting to get pretty long. Sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s1. To make this easier, rather than writing everything out, you can do something called noble gas notation, where for sodium, we write that it's got the electron configuration of neon, 3s1. So you can use any of these elements over here as noble gas notations. So you can use helium to represent 1s2, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, or radon. So these say, hey, they're, they're what we call noble gases, which as we'll learn as we keep going in this chapter, these are really stable elements. So we're just worried about the electrons that occur after that. So we use these as ways to fill in for, oh yeah, all those electrons are there, plus some others. So that gets us through the S and the P block. That'll get us all the way to argon. So as you keep adding them, so when I got to, I lost my pen, there we go. So like argon, for example, it had 18 total electrons. It had all the ones from neon. It then had 3s2, like if it were sodium or magnesium, and then all the way to 3p6 with the P block. So the, that gives us the rules for the S and P block. Each time you go one, you add one more into the block it would have been in. Now the rules change a little bit when you get to D and F. So when you get to period four and you get to the 21st element, that means you're now at 21 electrons, that's scandium. When you get there, you may notice, if you can read the small reading, that it's not 4S2, 4D1, but instead scandium it's got the configuration of argon and then 4s2, 3d1 rather than 4. This is because for all of the d blocks, so for d block, you do period minus 1. So those rows, for example, you go 4s2, 3d2, 4s2, 3d3. As you go across to titanium, vanadium, chromium, you subtract 1 from the number you put in front. Similarly, after you go a lot further and you get all the way to the F block, so that occurs down at element 58 when I'm past lanthanide and I'm into cerium. So when you get to the F block, the F block is going to be the period minus 2. 
So even though this element, cerium right here, is in period six, we're gonna put its new electrons in the 4f orbital. So 4f1, 4f2, 4f3. So that's one way to learn the order in which I fill my electrons. Now you may find, you may find that great, and if that works out well for you, use the periodic table as your visual guide to figure out where you put your electrons. But let's say you don't like that. You're like, I just don't see that, Dr. Leslie. Another way you can learn it is by learning this guide here. So we have, I write down all of the orbitals. So 1s, then all the 2s, 2s and 2p, there's no 2d. Then I write 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, and we don't go beyond f, so we're just going to stop at f each time. 6p, 6d, 6f, let me check my periodic table, yeah, just got to go to 7. Ah, my pen, my pen was trying to change slides on me, but I stopped it this time. 7p, 7d, 7f. And now what we do is we draw diagonal lines starting at the top right to do the filling order. And this may look a little weird at first, but just watch me and follow through. So our first orbit electrons go in the 1s orbital. Our next go in the 2s. Then we go in the 2p and the 3s. Then we go in the 3p and then we go in the 4s. Then we go in the 3d, the 4p, the 5s. Then we go to 4d, 5p, 6s. Then we go to 4f, 5d, 6p, 7s. Then we go to 5s, 6d, 7p. And that's all that we have of naturally occurring elements. This is the way I actually learned how to do this. It is also a little easier if you can draw really straight because it looks more like a grid then. So this is how I learned to memorize it. I would draw this at the front of my test when I was first doing it and it would remind me, hey, this is the order I fill up my electrons in. So if this helps you out, good for you. Another thing you may notice, or not you may notice, but can be helpful, is whenever you're doing noble gas notation, you're always going to start your next element in the S sublevel. So let's go back to our periodic table for a second. So for example, let's say you're going to work in period five. Well, when you write krypton down, krypton is in period four. That means the next electron has to go in the S sublevel. So you're going to start at 5S after, after you get through krypton. So you go into 5s, and then you follow the lines, and then you go to 4d, then 5p, and however many electrons you need to do that. It would also be helpful to remember how many electrons each of these can fill. So s, since it only has one box, and the box can fit two electrons, s can fit two electrons. p has three boxes, and I'm not going to fill each of these just to make my life quicker. This means it can hold six. D has five boxes, which means it can hold 10. And then finally, F, which we don't draw near as much. It does exist, though, and I will ask about it from time to time. It has seven boxes, which means it can hold 14 electrons. So this is way two you can memorize how to do this. The third and final way I'm actually going to include in this summary of rules. So electrons occupy orbitals that have the lowest possible energy. Therefore, you take the low energy and you fill it before the high energy. So the third way to do this is to simply memorize the order. It goes 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s, 4f, 5d, 6p, 7s, 5f, 6d, 7p. I do not think this is the best way to learn this material. Having said this, I know for some people it might be the easiest. And so to be fair, if this is the easiest way for you to learn this, that's okay. So if this is what you want to do, you can memorize that whole list. And, well, I have trouble memorizing giant lists of things. It might be that for you this is just way easier than all the extra stuff I'm doing of trying to look at a picture and figure out where stuff is. You might be like, oh, no, Dr. Leslie, I'm way better at just memorizing lists. I got this. So if that's what you can do, that works as well. So if you don't like memorizing the exact list, you can use either of the techniques I showed before, using the periodic table as a guide based on the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block, or by memorizing that grid and using those lines and being able to draw that as a reminder to build this list without having to memorize it quite as roughly. 
So orbitals can hold no more than two electrons, and they have to have opposite spin. So don't forget that. We can't have two ups or two downs, and there are no like sidewayses or anything like that. They just have two different orientations. And when orbitals have identical energy, we fill each orbital one at a time before pairing them together. So for example, if you were in the 3D orbital, 3D has five boxes. The first five electrons will all be on their own, one at a time, before you start pairing them together. So I want to do a little bit of electron configuration practice here, as well as do some more practice with noble gas notation. So I'm going to give some examples, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to give this a try, because so far I haven't asked you to practice much in this chapter. So I'd like you to try coming up with the configuration for calcium, and try coming up configuration for, let's say, cobalt, and let's do chlorine, and to practice something down here, let's do, let's say, ah, I'm trying to decide what other one I want to do. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you this one is down below. Let's look at europium, EU. So that's down in the inner transitions. I know this can be hard to find. You haven't looked at them much. So pause the video here and give these a try. Okay, hopefully you've tried them out. So let's start with calcium. I'm going to do the noble gas configuration each time. You should be able to also do the full configuration. It means I'll probably ask it to you once to make sure you understand what it represents. And then I'll use the shorter notation in most instances because it's faster. So calcium, argon, is the noble gas that occurs before it. And then we only have two electrons to go. So that's 4s2. Cobalt. Cobalt occurs in the same row. So it's also going to be argon. And so it is going to be 4s2. And then we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 over. So it's going to be 3d7. Now chlorine occurs in period 3. So we have the neon configuration. And then chlorine has seven more electrons than neon. Neon has 10, chlorine has 17. So the first two go in my or s orbital, 3s2. And then I still have extra electrons, I still have five. So next is 3p, and that has five. So that's how I'm figuring this out using that grid shape. So if we go back and look at the actual grid, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s. I'm not going to write the whole thing because this element isn't as big. This will be plenty. So what I did to use this as an example for chlorine, I knew it was in row 3. So neon has to finish right before 3s. So 1s, 2s, and 2p, those get accounted for by this neon here. Well, after 2p, well, now I had 3s. And s can hold two electrons, so I can put 3s too. I still had five left, though, because it had seven more electrons than neon. So 3p was next, and 3p can fit 6, but I only had 5. So I filled it up to 5 and said I was done. So now, let's do europium next. So europium occurs at 63 electrons. So that is in period 6. So period 5, we have xenon. Now here, we start with 6s2. So let's write out the rest of our grid for people doing the grid. 4d, 4f. 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, 6s, 6p, 6d, 6f. This will actually get me through. So I'm going to stop at this part of the grid. We go here. There's another seventh row that exists down below, 7s, 7p, 7d, 7f, just in case. So xenon would occur in period 5. So period 5 ends at 5p here. So now we're at 6s. 6s takes my first two electrons. That gets me to 56. Europium has another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 electrons. So it fits 7 more. So after 6s, we go to 4f. So this is going to be 4f7. So it's europium, that's a poorly drawn 4. I'll just redraw it. 6s2, 4f7. Xenon. That is my configuration for europium. Now, I do want to point out that when you're working with these electron configurations and you use this notation to figure it out, 
Sometimes your answers may come up a little different than what actually happens in reality. The reason for this is there are exceptions where certain types of orbitals are actually more stable than what shows up here. I am never going to quiz you on, oh, did you memorize this exception? But do understand that if you stick with us in chemistry, we will cover some more reasons of why some exceptions show up where they do, and you'll learn how to identify those. And to show you an example, I'm just going to do one real quick, which is chromium. If you used all the techniques I just went over to find the electron configuration for chromium, which has 24 electrons, you would have argon, and then you would find that it was 4s2, 3d4. For any of my tests, this would be okay. I would give you credit for this answer. But in reality, chromium is actually argon, 4s1, 3d5. This has to do with the fact that half-filled subshells are more stable than partially filled subshells. And so this one has two half-filled shells, whereas argon has a full 4s and a partially filled 3d, but not exactly half-filled. I am not worried about this exception in terms of memorizing it, but I want you to know things like this can occur. There can be small differences. And so it's not that that's wrong. So if you saw a problem that gave you the electron configuration, argon, 4s1, 3d5, you should be able to figure out that it's chromium because it has six electrons more than argon. And argon has 18. So 18 plus six should be 24. I mention this because some people will just look at the 3d5 and go to the 3D block and count one, two, three, four, five, and say that it's manganese, it's MN. But that wouldn't be right because you have the wrong number of electrons with it. So just make sure to pay attention to that when identifying what elements you're working with. And these configurations are the types of things that I think practice helps a lot with. That once you've done a number of them, they feel kind of easy, but at first they can feel kind of overwhelming, especially if the rules don't fit quite right with you yet. If you're like, I don't really get these lying things or how to do this, so I strongly encourage you, if these seem kind of weird to you, to make sure to get some practice at them. I think they get a lot easier as you do more of them.